Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, February 20th. Today's topic is using tech to engage students with learning disabilities. Our special guest is Billy Krakauer. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning. I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula Noggle, who not only will introduce Billy and ask the newbie question, but she's also going to interview Billy today. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at Classroom 2.0 Live. I am so excited to introduce our special guest today. So let me um, tell you that I first met Billy at the 2011 ISTE conference in Philadelphia in the newbie lounge. We had a wonderful conversation about Twitter and I showed him how I was using Twitter for PD and was getting involved in Twitter chats. He often refers to me as his Twitter mama. Since that first meeting, Billy and I have remained good friends and are always finding ways to collaborate. He has also gone on to become not only the host of several Twitter chats himself, but a co-author of several books. Let me tell you a little bit about, more about him before I interview him about his book, Using Technology to Assist Students with Disabilities. Billy Krakauer has an advanced certificate in educational leadership and a dual master's degree in special education and elementary education from Long Island University. Billy is a full-time teacher at Woodland Park Public Schools in Woodland Park, New Jersey, where he has taught computers and special ed to grades three and four over the last eight years. He is also the chief financial and event Officer for Evolving Educators, LLC. In 2014, Billy was named an ASCD Emerging Leader. He has presented at more than 20 local and national technology conferences on topics including Twitter and You, the science behind the mystery location call, and connecting beyond the classrooms. He is also a certified Google educator an Emoto Certified Trainer, a member of the Teacher Advisory Board for ReadWorks, a co-moderator of uh, New Jersey Ed Chat and Fat Chat, a lead organizer for Ed Camp New Jersey, which I had the pleasure to attend in person in 2014, and for Ed Camp Leadership in North New Jersey. He is also a co-host co on Fat Chat Radio, which is a weekly interview show which is part of the BAM Radio Network, and he's a co-author of a couple of books, one that he wrote with me. But today, we're going to talk about his other book. Billy is passionate about helping every child and adult enjoy and learn using technology tools in easy, fun, and empowering ways. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you our guest for today and my dear friend, Billy Krakauer. Billy, we have a newbie question for you to answer today. Why is it important for all teachers to be knowledgeable about using technology with disabled students? Hi, Paul. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's great to hear your voice. We need to hear it more often, but um, it is very important for all teachers to know, especially newbie teachers and teachers who are, are currently in programs in college. There's so much technology out there to enhance learning for learning for students with learning disabilities that sometimes it's overlooked and especially so many districts are going one to one. So many districts have Chromebooks or iPads. There's so many different little devices or apps or an extension that you can use with a student to help them succeed and level the playing field for the student who has a learning disability. Okay, I'm back on. I was having a little bit of a tech glitch there. Um, Billy, I truly agree with that and so we are going to begin our interview with you today with this question. 
How did you come to collaborate with Sharon Plate, both as teachers and as co-authors of your new book? I met Sharon. Where did I meet Sharon? Through one of the Twitter chats that I was doing, and she's come to. She lives in Connecticut, so we've hung out at many conferences in the areas, probably in EdCamp, New Jersey, or another EdCamp, or an EdScape, or one of those many events that we have in our area. And uh, we've always talked about both of us doing special education, and I was teaching resource room language art, and Sharon and I were going back and forth with how to help boys with dyslexia, and she introduced me to the Lego Story Starter Kit. And the two of us were talking, and I go, she goes, I know you're going to take this farther. I go, yeah, so what can we do to make it a father project? And we wound up collaborating through Google Hangouts and Edmodo using uh, Lego Story Starter, and the kids were sharing their stories that they would write with one another. So for those who don't know what Lego Story Starter is, it first of all can be used for any, for any level and any ability, but it works really well with students with learning disabilities because students actually build their stories first. They get a theme or a picture or background, and then they develop the beginning, middle, and end through Lego pieces, and then they have to write about those stories from the Lego. So it's actually helping them start writing, and it's great for any age. And that's kind of how Sharon and I started. Um, then me and her were going back and forth, and uh, I wrote my other book, and um, I was going back and forth with um, Arielle Price, who is the editor for Corwin, and she's like, wait, you have a special ed background? I go, yeah. She's like, we need a special ed book for the Corwin series. So I said, talk to my friend Sharon, and we just came up with the concept after that. So and it kind of trickled and in after our first book that we wrote, Paula, that was out in the fall, with the second book. Well, I know how much fun I had working with you and Jerry on ours. Um, did you do this as a collaboration through Google Hangouts and Google Docs? Yes, we uh, did it through Google Hangouts and Google Docs. Uh, a lot more on Google Docs and text message inboxing, um, any form of communication, direct message on Twitter that we're able to do. Okay, well, thank you for that. I am excited to um, learn even more about the LEGO Story Starters now that I've learned about it from you and through your book. Okay, our second question is, what inspired you to write this book? And um, we've talked a little bit about how you wrote it living in different places, but could you expand more on how you and Sharon got to um, started? I just wanted to make sure that thing is on talking. Um, the way we got writing is there was really, there's a lot out there on special education. There's a lot of textbooks. There's a lot of research, differentiated instruction in the classroom. There's always different ways, but there's nothing that we found that's really just geared towards technology and special ed students. There's a lot of resources out there, but there's nothing really out there that we found that something we wanted, something simple and easy to use. And if you actually purchase the book, you'll see there's a lot of stories. It's not just Sharon and I's ideas, it's other teachers as well. We have uh, Natalie Franzi who uses different tools and Monica Burns who uses the iPads. Natalie talks about, and I have to find out right now about a Chrome extension. I had to think about that for one second. And we have other teachers from around the country who are using different tools. We have a teacher from Alabama, Megan Everett. All their stories of how they're also using it for special ed students in the classroom. Okay, well the next thing I'd like to ask you about are what are some examples of assistive technology and why are assistive technologies important for students with learning disabilities? There's a number of assistive technologies out there and one thing that Sharon and I have always had this discussion, she does a lot more with assistive technology than I do, but it's having the right assistive technology. Just because you have assistive technology doesn't mean it's the correct one. Um, there's two tools that I love. One that I actually just got uh, the other day it's called, and I'm going to actually do a screen share so I could share with everyone. 
what it's called. It's called um, Audio Note Taker. And if I could get this going. On it, you can actually, there's two ways to record. You can either record directly to the computer or on a smartphone. There's an app where you can actually download. If I was say, I'm going to go for an example. Let's say I wanted to record what I'm doing right now. It records everything that I talk about and it puts it into notes by color. So that way I could go back and review what my notes are. So if you're taking a, gra a graduate course or even a high school or middle school course, you can have, if granted, you need the permission with the teachers to record the lecture so that way you can actually have the materials and the notes in front of you for a student with a disability. So that's one of the tools. Another tool that I want to share also is, I have to switch the sharing. Uh, it's for students who also, you know, have problems writing notes. And it's called, it's by Light Livescribe, and it's actually, they have different pens that record what students are either saying, you could record your voice, but you also have one called the Black Edition, and there's several others that record handwritten notes, and you can transfer it into OneNote or Evernote on your computer as well. So those are two, two tools that are very useful towards assistive technology. There's also just having an iPod and a computer can also be considered an assistive technology for students. I've always wanted to use a live scribe pen. One of these days I might get one. Here we go. All right, so moving on. Our next question is, I love this quote. In your book you say, it's not about the tech, but for some students it is. Tell us more about that. How do you, as a teacher, decide when to use tech and when not to use it? Really, it, I've, with my experience, it really sometimes depends about the student. It, it's more about the student than the tech. If the tech's going to help a student, then you need to use it. If a multiplication chart is going to help a student with their division problems, then go ahead. If touch math is going to, which is more of a modification, but it's an assistive technology that students touch the points. If that's going to help a student more, then give them a calculator to let them use that. If you want the students to have the best way of learning, that fits them the best. We always talk about differentiated instruction and tiered learning and all those wonderful things, but it's, it's really what the individual student does. Can I give my whole classroom 20 iPads? Yeah, that would be great. But do all my students need an iPad? May not. You need to find what works best for your students. Sometimes simpler is better, and sometimes a simple website for them to go home and practice with might be the best fit. That's so true. Do you have um, any special tools that you'd like to share with us to help uh, learning disabled students uh, to support them in reading and writing? Well, reading and writing, one would definitely be the live script pen, which I actually finally ordered myself one just to play around with one. I actually never used it. Uh, Sharon's used them and swears by them. And uh, Brian Freelanders also swears by them. They're great for students. A couple of ones that I'm going to share, and if I can actually find the correct window, because I went to go share it and realize that my screen is not sharing, are several things. One is, can I, hopefully my screen's up there, text help, and this is great, and it's actually right here, if you see on my screen right here, I can actually, it's an extension for Google. And it will allow me, of course, the screen is too big and I can't show what I want to show. Will will read to me what's on the computer screen. It has it available for Windows, Apple devices, and the, the Chrome extension, as you can see, is right here. And it should just work, but of course, I can't scroll all the way down to my screen. Another tool would be Bookshare, which is an amazing 
accessible library for students with disabilities, and it's all free. One tool, Paula, and I know you're going to agree with me, is ReadWorks, which actually has differing reading passages based upon lexial levels, which you can get the conversion charts for those who use DRA scores, but you can break it down based upon that, and also you can break it down based upon informational literacy, literacy or poetry. So those are some great reading and writing tools that are out there. Another one that I like, I know, I think you use it too, Paul, is uh, Nuzella, which also has different levels. Forgot to put my talk button back on. Yes, um, Billy and I are both uh, read workers, which means that we are a part of the teacher advisory board. So those are definitely um, some tools that we love. Um, to help set different Lexile levels for our students. Um, and um, I pronounce it New ZLA, but New ZLA, however you like to say it. Um, I love that I can pull up the same passage and I can print it off in several different Lexile levels for my students. So finding those tools are great. Billy, have you um, had any experience yet using the Google tool uh, voice typing? Remember to click talk. Okay, lost it. Billy, can you hear us? We are not hearing you. Did you forget to click your talk button? Yes, I forgot to hit my talk button there, Paula. Sorry about that. <laughs> that. That happens all the time. Don't worry about I'm it. I'm like I sitting here talking. I'm like, wait a second. Did I just <laughs> unclick it? Yep, it happens. Okay, so, so anyhow, we were um, going to have a little discussion about the Google um, tool called Voice Type. Have you been using that at all? Yes, I've been using uh, not that necessarily. I use on my school's Office 365 school, so we use a oh. lot of tools with um, Microsoft Office, Microsoft Word, has a lot of text-to-speech features inside it. OneNote would just announce that they were going to have a lot more features as well. I know from people I've talked to that the features of Google Voice and there's a different Chrome extensions that really do help students. There's also, and I'm forgetting it off the top of my head, I'll have to go look it up. There is actually a dyslexia font that you can convert to your computer screen on the uh, Chrome extension. So that way students who have dyslexia can read this font that studies have showed that it's an easier font for students with, dys with dyslexia to read. And, and it's so funny because um, one of the things that I've learned about this year with my fourth grade students was um, we were reading the book um, Fish in a Tree for the Global Read Aloud. And I was projecting the book on my Kindle app on my whiteboard, and then I was uh, using the audio, um, the audible version to let them listen to the book. So when I pulled it up on the white screen, you know, it's typically black print on a white screen, but in the Kindle app, you can change it to either sepia, which is kind of a brownish background, or you can change it to black with white words. So I played around with it. I was showing the kids the Kindle app and I asked them which one they liked, which one they preferred. And the vast majority of my students preferred me to set the Kindle app with the black background and the white words. They found that a lot easier to read. Um, I know when I use my interactive whiteboard and I'm projecting my slides that it's that they like a colored background. They just find it a little easier. So I tend to use like a light yellow or a very light shade of um, kind of like the orange that's showing on this slide right now. So those are things to keep in mind I, I feel is interesting for teachers in the classroom. Okay, so moving on to our next question. You touched a, just a little bit on it a second ago, but how do you, um, use assistive technology to support students in math who have dyslexia, dysgraphia, or dyscalculia. How do you pronounce that word? You said it right, Paula. It's 
Um, <laughs> now, now you're having me tongue twisted. This calcular, and actually, can I switch? Because I know I believe. Hopefully, Peggy loaded the slide. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they're up there. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't know when you wanted to go to those slides. There you go. Okay. So there's a few ones. The one at the bottom is actually a great one for dysgraphia. Um, and the other two, actually, I have to show this one tool because it's by far my favorite tool. And this doesn't have to be for students with disabilities. I've used this many, many times for regular ed class students as well. It's, um, sometimes students with disabilities, uh, dyslexia, dysgraphia, need a visual. And the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives, and this is not going to work because I just realized I'm in Chrome, and my Java and Chrome don't like to work together. So let me pull it up on Safari. Everyone can see my Safari, correct? Paula? Is my screen showing the Safari? Right now we're, we have a... We have a black box on top of it right now. I don't think you're on the. You might need to stop and redo it, Billy. Yeah, wait, it's coming in. I think it's starting. Here we go. Is it starting? Maybe, maybe, maybe. I wish no. I Why don't you stop screen? You know, stop, stop screen sharing. Right, and then reshare. Make sure it. you have that browser open. Right, yes, there. That's yeah, I have it open. I, I forget that it's a great tool, but if the Java is not updated in your. Um, Google Chrome, it doesn't like it, and therefore it won't work correctly. But it's through the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives, and they have many now different we're seeing it. levels. This is just one of my favorite ways to teach a lesson, because what you can actually do is if you drag this over, it breaks it up and regroups, as we have to say, and says break apart, because, you know, depends upon where you're teaching, it either could be breaking apart or regrouping, will show the students the blocks getting taken apart. And a lot of students with dyslexia just need to see that visual. There's also a ton of apps out there that are, are great. And if you go to Monica, if you search for Monica Burns, who's website, did I, should, did I throw that one on the slide? If not, I will pull that up as well. She, for those of you who teach with and have iPads, Monica has multiple, multiple resources on classtechtips.com for all types of students. Yes, yeah, she's got an awesome website. I'm sure Peggy will be thrown. There it is. Yeah, I there knew it Peggy is. would find I'm trying to get a Peggy to do it. <laughs> she beats everybody to it, Billy. Don't worry about it. Okay, so um, one of the other things we'd like to know about are what are ways that you allow your students to differentiate the way they show their understanding and knowledge? Again, it really depends. Um, I know at Sharon's school she has the devices, so students are allowed to show different ways, sometimes through inspiration, kidspiration, of what they learned. And it really depends upon what you have. Another fun way is Glockster, if you're doing a language arts project for students to kind of show what they learned. I've let my students use either for math, math is a little more difficult, but they could draw me pictures or write it on paper. There's a couple of apps that are out there that are great as well. And I'm drawing a blank on the app that I wanted to mention for a mod math. Mod math is a great app for the students to show what they've learned. It really depends on what you have available to you. Uh, there's a lot of free resources out there. If you're having students present, you can either have them do it orally. Uh, again, I said inspiration, Prezzo, go back to regular just old PowerPoint. Really what the students are comfortable with. I know, Paula, you love Thing ThingLink is another way. Anything that students are comfortable using is the best way to let them have their choice. Don't say, you have to show me and it has to be a PowerPoint presentation. Show them a bunch of different tools and let them choose what they're comfortable with. Okay, um, 
I'm going to, I had it in a different order, but I'm going to ask it to you this way now. Teachers often feel overwhelmed with all of the new tech tools and don't feel they have time to learn how to use them. What are some good ways teachers can learn about tech tools that will support their students' learning and how to, do they go about picking the, the right one? Uh, ask on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> it would be the best way. Now, th there's, there's so many tools out there. And I mean, Sharon and I were talking, and we had a limit of how many pages we were allowed to use. And we said, well, that's an issue because there's so many tools out there that you can share and use, and ever changing tools that are coming out, which are great. It's just, it's overwhelming. So it really comes down to what can you you do for you know students and kind of you know ask colleagues what's out there if you're if you're on Twitter saying looking for a tool for sixth grade students doing and say which lesson you're doing. Oftentimes if you do the hashtags ed or AT or AT chat, they will there's someone who will respond to you. It, it, it's a tough question. Also sometimes the easiest way is do Google searches. Or I'm going to do a shameless plug for my book, purchase using your technology to engage students with learning disabilities. We broke it down to a bunch of tools that are simple and easy to use. And Maureen, yes, Maureen, perfect. I'm glad you threw it out. Yeah, out that's there. all right. About we Facebook call. groups, understood.org, uh, graphite.org has a bunch of uh, common sense media. There, there's so many out there that I could keep going on and on and on. Okay, and then um, what is your understanding of UDL, Universal Design of Learning, and how um, in applying calling, uh, these principles can you address the needs of all learners? <clears throat> Uh-oh. Am I I'm having a little bit of bandwidth issues. Uh-oh. Yep. Hello. <sighs> that is can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you repeat that question, Paula? I think I missed it. I don't okay. Know, Paula. Yes, I sure can. I also dropped it in the chat. What is your understanding? That's all right. That's all right. What is your understanding of UDL and how, in applying its principles, can you address the needs of all your learners? I mean, generally, or as a special education, and there's different ways of how students can express the information and apply their knowledge. It's the how of learning, in more of mine and Sharon's view. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of simple ways would be just by scaffolding lower level skills so that they require less exec executable processing, uh, by scaffolding higher level executive skills and strategies so that more of an effective or, and develop. I'm, try, I'm trying to sum it up quickly because I also know. Are we pressed for time, Paula? No, we're doing fine on time. Got about 10 minutes or so. Okay. And the why, you know, the finally the why of learning is, you know, building and sustaining interest and motivation in learning. Sometimes we could just get students who are engaged and willing to listen and learn, sometimes that's all you know. And yeah, just technology enhance the lesson, but sometimes a dynamic teacher takes away from having the technology. Don't let the technology become the lesson. Let it be part that's of the lesson. So, that's so true. Okay, um, I know one of the chapters in your book, I believe, is about um, Becoming a study skills star. So my next question to you is, what are some of the study skills that are challenging for learning disabled students 
and what tools have you found helpful to teach them these skills? That probably is oftentimes the hardest thing for students with disabilities is being able to become a master at studying. Students may need more time or extra review and tools to help them work through various problems, but sometimes they just they need that extra review. Uh, and nowadays, you have a lot you can do with flip learning where you can create short videos. Um, this person has a great way and a great website for mapping the mind, sometimes having different graphic organizers for students, and the best place to find graphic organizers, probably you'll laugh, is our good friend Jerry Bluengardner's <laughs> website, cyberryman.com. And if you actually go to his you website and search graphic, graphic organizers, I, I know you have that one. Yes, we uh, have there. that one. It is funny, you can't write a book without mentioning Jerry's website. At all, or, or do a Twitter chat, right? Or do a Twitter chat, or do a <laughs> webinar. And I was, I was so trying to avoid it this time. I'm like, yeah, I can't avoid it. But I would no. definitely say graphic organizers. Uh, again, inspiration. There's a bunch out there. Poplet. Just are a few tools. Jerry's has a bunch of different graphic organizers. Just that's the biggest thing is students with disabilities need to be really guided on how to organize themselves and that's where they always are having trouble. So being able mm -hmm. to do that would be the best way. Also, my favorite thing, and I still sometimes make my kids do it, regular old flashcards. I uh, love flashcards. Uh, one of the tools that I use um, all the time is Quizlet. Yep. I only use the free part of it. And um, I've been sending out um, remind notices where I make a um, like, sort of like a homework helper sheet every week. And I include the link to my Quizlet for um, the flashcards and the study games. And the parents love it because, you know, sometimes my, um, I call them helicopter parents, would go, would take the notes and you know, recreate flashcards for their kids and stuff like that or quizzes. And this saves them a lot of time. So I absolutely love using it. Billy, you and I have collaborated many times over Skype and um, Google Hangouts with our students. When we are doing those kind of things, right now I know you're not a SPED teacher, but when you were, um, were there any special things that you had um, your learning disabled students, were there special ways that you um, or special jobs you gave them during the video conference calls that helped them feel, you know, as much a part of it as any other student would? Yes, there's, you know, it really depends upon, I have always um, looked at those students first to decide what jobs I'm giving out, because sometimes those students are Oh, well, they have a learning disability. They can't do it. Well, you know what? They sometimes could do a job better than a regular ed student. But they need to have that opportunity. Oftentimes, sometimes my special ed kids are the ones who would be the ones speaking at the mic because they're more comfortable at talking rather than researching and reading something. So it really depends upon the individual student. But sometimes those students should be a priority rather than a secondary. I agree. Um, in your book, you share some great examples on how Siri on the iPad or iPhone can be used by students beyond just asking questions. Can you share some examples of that with us? Siri can read things out loud. I'm forgetting the settings because I will say this, that was Sharon's school is all Apple. My school is all Office. That's kind of why the book came together very nicely because we had the two different views. But I believe, and also on the fence, there's the text-to-speech help that you can go mm -hmm. into the settings on the iPhone or on the iPad, and Siri could read out the information to you, and that is one of the biggest ways. Also, it's in test of technology, but that Siri can be integrated. Plus, you could just ask yeah. Siri for how to do it. I know. Love Siri. Uh, it's so nice for when you're trying to find your way around in a city that you don't know. Um, all right, so I think, um, let's see, I'm looking through my notes to see if we've covered pretty much everything. 
And I'm flipping through my book right now to see if there's anything else. I oh, want to um, this is one question that I think um, comes to the minds of some people. What would you say to teachers who think that if you provide students with tools that read their textbook to them, that it excuses them from learning how to read? Is that considered cheating? Um, it, do we need that? I know that um, I, I feel badly because sometimes I, you know, use those assistive technologies with my students on a day-to-day -day basis, but then when we come to state testing, we are not on computers doing state tests. We're all paper, pencil. So I feel like, oh, am I properly preparing my students? So what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I have a major, major thought an issue with that. We're, we're, we do online testing and it's, I, I understand the reasons why, but like for instance, we have our math test that's online. The questions for the math test can be read to a student through the online program. However, because the other test, the reading test is testing reading, they're not allowed to have any modifications, which makes sense, but at the same time, you know, it's such a struggle and the whole concept of testing and giving grades really should be reconsidered because I honestly think we're testing students way too much. It, you know, it, it comes to a point in time where how much testing, it, it's we teach to the test nowadays rather than letting the kids explore and I actually have been teaching uh, STEM this year and have been developing a maker space and oftentimes my students with disabilities do much more better of a job than the other students because they could see things differently and there's also no pressure there's no assessments on them generally there yeah they're getting assessed but they're not getting assessed with a test that they have to count and that counts for this and counts for that it's more of them actually letting them be in students and learning and I think we lack that oftentimes in schools when there's such a focus on testing. I agree with you so much on that. Um, that's one of the reasons why um, I think more educators need to be involved with the high stakes testing and, um, and, and show them what really is going on in our classrooms. Who was that? Um, okay. Hold on, Paula. Somebody just said it. I just lost it in the chat window that it's true, the high speed testings aren't testing students at their level. It's testing them at, you know, whatever the grade level is. But whatever their student, grade level is. Yeah. They're, so they're yeah. automatically going to fail. Who is this? Who wrote this? I just found it and I kind of scroll up slowly. I can't find. SDID mom. mama. Because the test did yeah. not demonstrate student growth. And it's true. It's not demonstrating a student can grow who has a disability, but it may not be measured on a state test because the state test is not at their level. Exactly. And that's what, it, that is such, um, oh, it just, you know, ties me up in knots when I think about, you know, I, I go along every day and I'm doing my thing and my kids are growing and we're having a great time in the class. And yet in the back of my brain is this, oh, the test is coming, the test is coming. And I'm thinking, you know, we had a conversation last uh, yesterday with the principal, and I said, you know, the, it doesn't make sense. I do my day-to-day -day stuff one way where we take lots of time to dig into the reading text, and we read it three times, you know, to do a close read, and then they're going to take a state test, which is timed. And I'm like, why should we time them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but anyhow, that's a subject for another day. Okay, so we are kind of getting to the end where we want to wrap this up. So I'm going to turn this over to you, Billy, to share any last thoughts that you would like to um, about using technology to engage students with learning disabilities. Why don't you wrap this up for us? Some final thoughts would be that there are so many tools out there. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed by all the different tools. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of you might need to try two or three tools with a student before finding out what the best thing for them is. Try it out. Let the students try it. Sometimes the students are the best ways and best person to tell you if they like it or they don't like it. 
Don't be afraid. Oftentimes people are afraid to use technology. Don't be afraid of the technology. Yeah, the student might know more about it than you, but it's going to help the student. So try different things out and just go for it. I would say using tech is kind of like um, driving a car. Um, you know, when I learned how to drive a car, yes, it was very scary and, um, you know, I didn't want to crash into anything and I wanted to make sure I was doing it right. But I don't know everything about how a car works, but I can still drive one. And I believe that using technology with students is kind of like that. I'm not going to know everything about it. I can introduce it or they can introduce it to me and we can learn together. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my mic off and turn it over to Lori Moffitt, who has been collecting questions from the chat um, that has gone by. And if you have any further questions for Billy, if you would type them in the chat room, Lori will now proceed to the question and answer part of our show. Thanks so much, Billy, for being here. And thanks to Maureen. There's only one question to ask Billy. And if I scroll up here in the chat, I can Thank see. Thank you, Maureen. Yes. Did you or do you use UPAR for reading assessment? And this was actually from Maureen. No. Um, I, we, when I was doing reading, we were just using DRAs, um, DRAs. This year, just actually last month, we went to a program called STAR 360. And we might be using that now for reading assessment because it gives student reading levels and it's computer based. And we've been looking for something computer based due to the fact that testing is on the computers and we should be testing students on computers rather than, well, they, they still should be able to read and pick up a book. But because of state testing, we need something that's going to a little bit more align it to state testing. So we're actually uh, looking into STAR 360. Um, the, well, the administrator, administration is looking at the use of using STAR 360. I had it actually tested in computer class. That's the answer to that. Okay, thank you. And again, thanks to Maureen for capturing and, and sharing answers for the questions in chat. Um, and Maureen, do you want to get on the mic to share? May not have a mic. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions for Billy to answer? See, a couple people are typing. So we may have a couple more questions. Maybe those are all the questions for today. I'll turn the mic over to Peggy to talk about upcoming shows. And thanks so much for Billy and Paula today. Yes. Thank you both. Billy, it was so great to hear you just elaborate and share some of the not only amazing experiences you've had, but the many stories and things that we'll be able to find in your book. And I have already found this has just been so helpful. And it's such a great reminder for all of us that we all have students who have special needs whether they've been identified as special education students or not. And you have so many great ideas that will get us going on that. So thank you. And th Paula, thank you so much for all of your work in preparing the interview questions and, and guiding us through this new experience. It worked out really well. So thanks a lot. 
our show next Saturday, we get to continue with Paula facilitating our session, and it's going to be an open mic session. So if you've been in those before, you need to come ready to share. So that means have your ideas and have your mic ready so you can turn on your mic and get on the mic and share. We're going to be talking all about games in the classroom. They might be board games, card games, dice games, any kind of game, and absolutely games that use technology. So, But it's not just limited to technology, so we hope you'll come back next week and join us for that. On March 5th, we have Eric Kurtz joining us, who does amazing things with Google. And this session, he's going to focus on awesome uses for Google Drawings in your classroom. And then on March 12th, we have Brad Spearson joining us from Participate Learning. And that is a fabulous new tool for collaborating and sharing resources with other teachers and with students. I know you're going to want to learn more about that, and it's free. So we hope that you'll join us every Saturday, same time, same station. And we'll look forward to seeing you with us. Thanks. And Lori, go right ahead and take over and take us out. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including hosting your own webinar. You can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room like this one and host an event. As long as you make it public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher. This is a form to do that on this website. Uh, I think that the location for the form also is in the live binder for each month in that resources tab. Uh, you can also nominate yourself for a featured teacher of the month. As you exit the session, the survey should open up. If it doesn't, you can also take the survey link from the chat box. It's in the live binder in the resources tab. When you complete the survey, you can ask for a professional development certificate. It now prints out with your name. Please, though, use a personal email address to request this. Schools tend to block you from getting this certificate. The audio and video collections are both in iTunes U as well as in RSS feed. And the full recordings are available on the Classroom 2.0 website. Special thanks again to Billy Krakauer and to Paula Noggle for asking our questions today. To Steve Harkadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution. To Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform. And to everyone who participated in the show today, thanks so much. <laughs>